Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm gonna talk about one of the most infamous serial killers of Switzerland, Werner Ferrari. Werner Ferrari was born on the 29th December of 1946 in Basel to an 18-year-old mother. In his first four years he lived with his grandmother, because his mother Gertrude was probably too young or didn't have the means to take care of him. After those four years he started to live with his mother again, where she neglected him and beat him every time he didn't behave like she wanted to. This all started in 1951, as his mother put him in his first children's home, the one in Rümlingen in Canton Basel. He only lived there for a short time. This was the same for Wiesen in Graubünden and Herisau in Appenzell Rauserroden. The only thing that was special in Herisau was that the school psychologist there advised him to go to the children's home God Helps in Igis Graubünden and on May 8, 1953 he was transferred there. At this point he's 7 years old and he was already in quite a lot of places and even allegedly beaten and almost drowned by his stepfather. Only a half year later he was transferred to children's observation station which is the long term for psychiatry. It was in Riefnach, Argau. There he was described as having pseudo-debility, concentration disability, being neglected and having infantility. In June 1954 he was yet again transferred to another children's home named Kinderheim Neuenweg in Adelboden, Canton Bern. There the social educators noted that he would steal, lie and wet the bad bird, was in need of love, affectionate and eager to work. In 1958 his mother Gertrude remarried his legal guardian, I don't know who that was at the time, but I don't think I need to say what comes next. I'll let you guess what happened. If you guessed he was transferred yet again, you're absolutely right. Yet again, he was in a new place, this time in boys' educational home Schilling's Rain, in Liestal, Canton, Basel. He said about that time, and I quote, My mother never kissed me, didn't hold my hand, or comforted me when I cried. I was just going back and forth, pushed around like an annoying piece of furniture, hoping that someone would dispose of it inconspicuously. He said some things about his time in the educational home too, and that is, I quote, or more like, I try to translate it as good as I can. It's something big in thoughts and words to rebel against that injustice or against a concrete emergency like the one we had back then in the reformatory with hands to grab was just a symptom of gigantic eternal injustice or more precisely the human one indolence and stupidity was one evidence of the disruption of a barbaric environment for many years the new father of the house had not made it fairer happier freer or more humane a house full of unhappy children like we were back then. In the next years after 1962 he was convicted for multiple arson and some other petty crimes. Starting April 1965 he was convicted for risk to railway operation as he placed a stumbling block on the railway of the Seal Talban. Mid-April he was wanted for that and was found pretty fast and was put in institution for epileptics in Zurich to investigate his psyche. Terry was noted that he was an introverted and shih young man with poor contact and is at risk because of his lack of adaptability. After some petty crimes he got put in a university hospital in Friedmat, Basel, where Professor Ducor made a report of Werner having an infantile personality, which in addition to the undevelopment of intelligence and character, also having psychopathic traits and a shih contact weakness. He even noted that Werner had a tendency to be unpredictable and doing abrupt acts, and couldn't exclude him of becoming a pedophile and doing pedophilic crimes. At that time, while he was in the university hospital, he would go out and walk in the woods of the borderlands to friends where he somehow got to know a girl and even cuddled with her in the woods. This is all just on his account, not on any other at all. So you can just take it with a grain of salt. Anyways, even if this did happen, it didn't hold for long. As he said, when someone passed near them, he put his hand over her mouth and as he self-described, almost killed her. After that, he said he didn't went there anymore. He was 19 years old at that point. He was at that university hospital till 1967, so till he was 21 years old. From 1967 till 1971, nothing really changed in Werner's life. It just stayed as before. He got jobs, stole from them, then got fired. Now we'll come to his first murder. It was the 6th August 1971, a warm evening in the Rheinach Basland at the village festival. Little Daniel Schwan, 10 years old, was most likely enjoying the nice and warm evening at the village festival, but he never was seen alive again after that day. 
The mother probably went to the police after not finding him herself. Police and volunteers started to search for the boy the day after in a place called Reinach Heide at Dornach, where Daniel was last seen. The police even used search dogs to try finding Daniel. They started to search neighboring places like a factory channel where he could have, in theory, fallen in while exploring. But after not finding anything at all, just his bicycle at the village festival, fall play was suspected and the police was right for suspecting it. There are two stories I'll tell here, and the most likely true one is probably the first. Little Daniel Siobhan, 10 years old, arrived at the village festival by bicycle, was most likely just enjoying it, when Werner Ferrari approached him and took him apart of the near what's called Moosholz and strangled him to death. As this was the one believed by the police and all people who didn't believe Werner, as his story is a little different. He claimed that he wanted to walk little Daniel home, as he knew him from the local pool. But while walking, Daniel started to cry out when passerby passed near them, and Werner put his hand over Daniel's mouth to stop him from screaming. Werner said after realizing that the boy wasn't breathing anymore, he tried to reanimate him, but he didn't succeed it and left the scene. What version you want to believe isn't for me to decide, but I for myself think that he was knowing what he was doing by taking the boy. By his statement, he covered his mouth, but you don't need to cover his mouth and nose to stop someone from screaming. If you cover his mouth and nose, you just want to either knock somebody out or just straight up kill him. Let's talk about how Ren Ferry was catched. What do you think did it for him? What got him? No, it wasn't for any forensic evidence. It wasn't either for any eyewitnesses. Neither did any pictures or videos catch him. And he didn't surrender himself. So you might be thinking, what got him caught? Well, it was his own stupidity. At a restaurant in Liechtal on the 12th of August, a landlady told the police that on the 7th of August, so just five days earlier, and one day after the death of the boy, Werner called her to ask if the missing boy's disappearance was already on the radio. But on the 7th of August, his disappearance wasn't public knowledge at all. Werner was caught on the same day of the 12th of August and interrogated. In the interrogation, he claimed that he had overheard someone in a telephone booth talking about it. Who might have guessed it? Asking for information about something just a day after you committed the actual crime wouldn't be the smartest of ideas. But well, he was described as having an underdeveloped intelligence and thank God because that mistake got him arrested. And he might never have been found guilty for that if he didn't make that mistake. Because the police at that time didn't have any evidence at all. At the 18th August he confessed to the murder of Daniel Schwan. On the same day the police took him to the before mentioned Moosholz and he showed them where the body was. He even made the signed confession with his motivation being to do sexual acts with the boy. On the 12th of April 1973 he was found to be guilty of the intentional murder of Daniel Schwan and got 12 years of jail or how it was called at that time here in Switzerland 12 years of Zuchthausstrafe. His first year of the sentence till August 1976 when I was at penitentiary Torberg. Until he was released, he stayed at the penitentiary in Regensdorf. What he recounted from the penitentiary in Torberg, that he saw an inmate get stabbed like an animal and that the victim's scream could have only been made by someone who got his gut sliced open. Werner said that his screams almost made him go insane. But I think we can say with 100% assurance that he was already crazy before getting in jail. Just to let you all know, but I'm using a well-made paper of Werner's story, created by Peter Holenstein, as a basis for all of this. I'll link it down below. He commented on Daniel Schwann's murder, as he said, that he can't hear helpless screams and that he didn't want it to kill Daniel, and if he didn't scream, it wouldn't have happened. As something just breaks in his head when he hears helpless screams. Even worse when it's a child's. As he hurls himself when his stepfather tried to drown him or when he got beaten as a child or when he got abandoned as a child. So he kind of hears himself in the cries. Anyone but even harder when children cry. 
and just kind of goes blank. Werner even said that he couldn't believe it all when he saw Daniel dead and thought little Daniel got a heart attack from being scared. Which kind of sounds unbelievable if you ask me, but well, his intelligent was underdeveloped so he could have actually thought that to be real. While he was being held in jail on the investigation of Daniel Schwann's murder, he wrote the mother of Daniel a letter. The short version is that he was sorry and won't ask forgiveness as he knows he doesn't deserve it and he doesn't know how it happened and would wish this all to be a dream. After he got sentenced he got once again a psychiatric appraise where it was declared that he had distinctive pedophilic and homosexual predisposition. But let's talk about his sentence. 12 years for murdering a child is, is crazy, like that's not enough. And it gets even worse. Then just after 6 years of his sentence served he got released and put on protective supervision for three years so he kind of let out on probation for three years kind of but it's just like the nice version of probation where it's more like help for you than help for the people that live around you anyway that all was on the 11th of august 1979 after his probation how you could call it ended the head of the protective supervision wrote to Anna I quote you are pleased to see that you have really changed even though I am convinced that you are on the right path there is still the possibility that certain problems will arise I would therefore like to let you know that we are always here to assist you should you need our help let's get to his second third and fourth murder as you could have guessed his story didn't end just with one dead child his second chance was more like a fiat of jail card because just a little more than one year after his probation ended, on the 27th of October 1983, he killed again. This time it was Benjamin Eggley, a 10 year old boy that was riding his bike from his home in the community of Steinmauer in Dielsdorf, Canton Zurich, to a not known place. His body was found just a day later by a mushroom searcher in the forest Regensberg. The police didn't find any evidence and tried to appeal to the public by asking if anyone had seen the boy on the day he went missing. The questions and the description of Benjamin Eggley got on all kinds of newspaper, but sadly they didn't get any new information and this case remained a cold case for six years. If you were listening to what I said, you probably were asking how we know that Ferrari was the perpetrator and if there were no evidence, how did he got connected to the case at all? As you will see, this will be for the next two murders the exactly the same thing, but just keep the names in your head as we will come later to how he was connected to this all. On the 7th September of 1985, Benner struck yet again as he convinced Daniel Sutter, a 7 year old boy, to come with him and strangled him to death. Daniel was missing for 3 days till a farmer found his body in Brook, still with the murder weapon around his throat. It was a slim rope. Ferrari probably used the vehicle as the boy was from Rheum Lang was found in Brook. The police did the same as for Benjamin Egli and asked the public for any information. They even put a bounty out this time of 8,000 Swiss francs. This would be the equivalent to today's 12,550 Swiss francs, that is 14,250 US dollars or 11,320 pounds or 13,250 euros. They didn't get any information at all sadly and the case remained cold for four years. In November 1986, Ferrari got a job as an assistant chef at the children's home in Oberegi in Canton Zug. But just in March of the next year, so 1987, he got fired after it got out that he had prior sexual assault at the child. Or more like he killed a child, so yeah. He tried to get similar jobs by pretending to being schooled in child education and as a social worker, but as we know, he never did learn anything in that direction at all. In the same year that he got fired on the 19th of October, he lured Christian Wittmer, a 10-year-old boy, away from a Jungscharfest, that is a kind of Christian festival that is there for children to have a possibility to hear about Jesus and the Christian religion. The Jungscharfest was in Windisch, Canton Argau. His body was found half naked just 600 meters or 2000 feet from the place where the body of Daniel Sutter was found two years ago. The autopsy showed that he was the victim of a sexual crime and that he was strangled and suffered from other not named sadistic injuries. The police put out yet again another bounty of this time 10,000 Swiss francs, would be the equivalent of 15,300 Swiss francs today or 17,370 US dollars. 13,800 pounds or 16,150 euros. There was no information given and led to any arrest, so this case remained cold for two years. Now we come to the last murder, the murder that got him caught. 
On the 26th of August 1989, Ferrari committed his last murder. Fabienne Imhof from Hagendorf in Canton Solothurn, a nine-year-old girl, was with her parents on the village festival. And while the parents were eating dinner at a restaurant, the young girl went with her friend Leo Schmidt, this is a fake name, to different roller coasters and attractions. At the way back to the parents, Ferrari talked to them and convinced them to go with him a little far away. And he then sent Lea away and continued with Fabienne. Lea probably told the parents about Fabienne and what happened and they alarmed the police. But even with the false reaction of the parents and police, Fabienne was not found till the day after. She was found strangled on the outskirts of the local woods. Two days later, task force of people from all cantons, cantons equivalent to states in the US, just way tinier. The task force was made of investigators from all around the cantons where children have been missing or were found murdered. The task force name was Rebecca. It was named after Rebecca Bieri, a 8 year old little girl that went missing on the 20th March of 1982 in Getnau in Canton Luzern. One day later her clothes were found in a creek bed in Rohr, Canton Argau. Her body was found on the 15th of August of the same year in Niederbib, Canton Bern. The only clue the police had was a white Mercedes with a license plate from Zurich was seen around there. What was strange as it happened to be in the more rural part where such nice cars would never have been seen. A thousand and ninety of them and their owners were searched but nothing was found. But let's get back to the main reason of this video. In the meeting of the task force, the officer mentioned how Werner Ferrari could be the killer as he looked pretty similar how the friend of the victim described the man who took Fabienne. On the 30th of August 1989, a judge greenlighted the warrant for Werner, with the reason being he looked a lot like the description of the eyewitness, Lea. Name changed. Werner was arrested at the same day in his apartment in Olden Canton Solothurn. The police thought the best chance of getting the case to stick on him is if the eyewitness could identify him, but they did not do a personal confrontation between them because the young age of Lea. So they used photos of random people and one of Werner was put in them too. She picked unerringly Werner's photo with the words, This man doesn't just look like him, it is him. At the same time, there was another bounty for any clues that could lead to arrest. This time, it was 20,000 Swiss francs. That is the equivalent to almost 30,000 Swiss francs today, or 34,000 US dollars, 27,000 pounds, or 31,000 euros. On the 17th of September, so just about two weeks later, Two officers of the Zolotron Cantons police went at 9 a.m. to the pre-trial detention center where Werner was. They questioned him for three hours but only got 13 lines written from what he told them. The questioning they did was used as a foundation stone for what Werner till today says was a pseudo confession. As one of the officers questioned him built a fatherly bond with him, Werner handed over a written confession that started with the words, I'm certainly the perpetrator. Just later, he withdrew his statement with the reason of the officer not the one with the bond to him, but his partner, pressed him to confess over unredeemed promise. On the 26th, so just nine days after the first questioning, the next big questioning began. And it began with the words, you have agreed by way of conversation to take all of crimes since your release in 1979 in which children were killed on yourself. How do you justify this position? Werner's response was, I searched during all my life the contact of children with no sexual interest. I never violated the child, I just searched for the closeness and warmth, because I grew up in different children's home. I had intensive contact with teens. This inclination didn't go away even in my later life. I found it difficult to make contact with adults, thereby I searched always for something unexplainable and believed to find this most likely from children. Especially from children who voluntarily tried to make contact with me. I had good contact. After saying this, Werner drew various him known crime scenes and explained that he didn't have anything to do with these crimes and just knew the fact from the press and didn't want it to be associated with these crimes. The next day, he wrote a letter to the judge, just yapping about his life with no real value for me to explain. So I'll just, I'll just skip it. On the 28th of September, he had another interrogation where he confessed that he murdered Christian Witwer and Benjamin Egli. The same day, his confession was validated in front of a judge by Werner himself, so that he can take it back. But, just the next day, Werner sent a letter to the judge that he had to take back his confession as this was a lie. And the next day after, he took back his taking back of his confession by stating that he must apologize as in the moment he can't think straight and he knows that he is the killer but he can't believe it. On the 3rd of October, he yet again wrote a letter yapping about the situation. I'm gonna skip this one too. Three days later, he said 
last confession, saying it's true that beside Fabienne I killed three boys. To the question why he tried to take back his confession, he replied with, there are moments where I can't believe it myself. The third court process started on the 8th of December 1994 in front of the District Court of Baden in Canton Aargau. It didn't even last it for a day, as the public defender of Werner quit after Werner took his confessions back multiple times. For the second trail, it followed from the 6th till 8th of June 1995, still in front of the District Court of Baden in Canton Aargau. There wasn't enough solid evidence. But, don't worry, they could convince the court with more than enough circumstantial evidence that Werner Ferrari was the culprit and he got sentenced to life in jail. Werner didn't want to say any closing words, but his public defender read out loud a letter Werner gave him before. In this letter he talked about how nobody could know how he feels about all that happened and how he can't reverse it and how in the future it should be prevented such things to happen again from people like him. He talked about how his childhood was terrible and just yapped about how he feels from all this. The key role to actually locking him up was uh, a psychiatric appraisal from Mario Etzensberger, the head doctor from the clinic in Königsfeld. Dr. Etzensberger noted that it seemed like Werner mostly told things like it was someone else, and because of its shit sweet personality disorder he couldn't fully understand what he had done. In the pretrial detention he wrote some letters with mostly saying that he had felt the last years. I won't be translating it all, be mostly because enough sentences he wrote are just one word or no, or no real sentences at all. So I'll just keep it short. He tries to see his old professor to core, but he wasn't at the clinic. He gets to know a child that claims to be almost 10 and drinks beer, and the child visits him for years. He got his first girlfriend. He hears the family having an argument above his apartment and hears the child cry. That scares him and he moves away from there. He is alone again, but knows a lot of children. Visits from children get more, so he gets scared and sends a lot away, but they come back. And he moves away. He sleeps bad, hears the screams of the man who got killed in the prison in Forberg. The before mentioned child who drinks comes to visit him and drinks himself to blackout. He gets to know a doctor and gets some medication that helps a little. Then it says Benjamin Egli died and the cry for Torberg. He tries to suppress his memories and drives to Basel searching for Professor Ducor, but he is now himself a patient. Werner got him some flowers and writes he was a nice man. He goes back to Zurich. A nine year old girl comes a lot and he goes on long drives and walks with her. He asks himself what kind of child she is, as he doesn't know her parents, but he is allowed to hug her. He cries and she asks why, but he can't tell her. Then Rimlang, a nice boy, malfunction, off, to go mad, I am desperate, then thinking, then drinking, the scream from Torberg. I am scared of myself, I don't know myself at times, I don't believe in myself. Think about life. Then. Irene, name is changed, a nice woman, head on stomach, get warmth. Then Fabienne, get warmth, she looks into my soul. I cry. Then the coming end both happens at the same time. The scream for Fabienne and the scream of Torbert. Something is destroying me. The monstrous, the terrible end. It was mostly written like that, just one sentence or one word and then another line. The court president at the time, Guido Neff, talked about that Werner knew that the children would cry sooner or later and that he must then turn it off. By strangling them from an inner force there was only for Werner the option of killing them and Werner described it as he couldn't hear them cry. He would start strangling them and get angry. He said he would stop if he would hear the child scream for their mother or he would beg him to stop. He claimed he never would do anything to actively make any child cry. Mario Etzensberger was convinced that Werner would never do anything to make a child cry. And for him, Werner is not a classic sexual offender, as he didn't have any sexual thought for children, allegedly. His motive was that he searched for the body warmth and the feeling of childlike safety. Werner said he never had any intercourse with the child and never did any sexual act with the child, and his longing was only for warmth of their stomach. He never wanted to do anything to children. Werner was actually liked by many children as he even after being arrested, he got many letters and postcards from various children asking how he was. Dr. Essensberg recommended to lock Werner away as he's a danger for society and giving him accompanying treatment but as his sentence was life in jail, he was found not to be needed any treatment as he would never leave jail anyways. So around the 2000s prison director of 16 years around that time said that Werner never caused any problems nor did he do anything bad while in prison. Around the 2000s, 
the parents of Fabian Imhof collected signatures for a new, or better said, an addition in the laws for criminals who are likely to reoffend and or are declared not treatable to stay in jail and not to be let out. 2004, they clarified in an interview that they are not doing it for vengeance and had even forgiven Werner Ferrari. The only thing that happened till today was that he tried to get his case in court again but failed. Uh, he had some documentaries made of him. Let's now go to kind of something that hasn't directly to do with Werner Ferrari, but at the same time does. And this is Peter Hollenstein. Again, this is the man who wrote the document or dossier that I'm using for the basis of this video. And a big thanks to him, as it had so much detailed information and the whole story and even some things that wouldn't be possible to find anywhere else. He even did the extra step and sent letters to Werner and visited him personally. The only Peter Hollenstein I found any information about indicated that he was the one who wrote this dossier, died back in, in 2019 following a heart attack. He was almost like a real Sherlock Holmes from things that I read about him. He actually had two times of cleaning people of cases that they weren't the perpetrator of. The first case was in 1979 in Italy where a Swiss man was 24 years in prison for something he didn't do. And the second time was where Werner Ferrari was thought to be the murderer of, of Ruth Steinmann, but after a hair that was found on her body was sent by Peter personally to a DNA comparison and it didn't match Werner's DNA, he was found not guilty in a revision of that case. So Peter Hohenstein was just him. He had the dog in him. And thank you, a big thanks to him, and hopefully he rests in peace knowing he made a difference. He was just the man. Now, I'll talk about things Werner said while Peter was visiting him and or in letters to him. They both wrote around 2000. Peter said about all his visits and letters, Werner Fari seemed to have a broken personality. Sometimes there was Werner and some other times there was Marco. Marco seemed to be the one who did the murders while Werner seemed to be the more passive scared one. His alter ego Marco said, to him in one of his visits that all the evidence who would have shown him not to be guilty had been destroyed. Werner wrote how he didn't murder any of the children and never did anything bad to them. And then in other letter, with an other handwriting, Marco wrote about how he felt bad when he killed any of the children and how he cried after it happened. Werner never cared much about his future as he was always kind of searching for evidence in his mind to make himself believe of his own innocence. And this is how his story ends. To today, he's still alive and in prison. Nothing ever happened again. Thank you for being here till the end. And again, thank you to Peter Hollenstein for this just really perfectly written document. Thank you for watching. Make sure to check out.